Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to Sunil and Dr. Bapur Lunawat, from the director of IST, for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I hope you're all staying safe in these trying times. Um, my name is Lee Capes. Uh, I currently reside in India uh, with my husband David, who's now looks like people can hear me. I hope so. And uh, feel free to send messages, as that gives me a little bit of um, confidence that it's coming through clear and you're able to understand what I'm talking about. Um, I'm living in uh, Delhi with my husband David John, who's director of high performance for Hockey India. We've been, I've been living here in Delhi for the last two and a half years and really loving living in your beautiful country. Um, today's world, in today's world, uh, particularly over the last couple of months, distance learning is the only option at the moment. And although we're in isolation, I'm actually feeling a little bit more connected. As I was saying, I'm currently living in Delhi um, with my husband David John, who's Director of High Performance for Hockey India. I've been here for the last two and a half years. And um, with distance learning now really the only option, um, really IAST are ahead of their time with the courses that they've been offering online. And very excited to um, see that in the future, possibly by the end of the year, IST will be offering a hockey course. Um, but as I said, ahead of the times, with distance education being the only way to uh, learn and connect, besides being in isolation, I'm actually feeling more connected with all of the world because um, we're having this opportunity to, to learn and listen from wonderful speakers. I've been listening to a lot of the speakers over the last couple of weeks and um, just been terrific to share their journeys and, and continue to learn from them and hopefully it will make us all better people in the future. Um, I will stay available as a resource for you, um, particularly ahead of IST offering hockey as a course later on in the year which is very exciting and I'll put my email address at the end um, if you wish to um, make contact with me. However, I will allow a bit of time for questions at the end and so feel free to, to send questions um, with anything you want me to discuss later on. Um, I'm, I can talk to you today from a variety of perspectives that I've been involved at at a high level. I've been an international player, um, coach, manager, parent, journalist, and I've even umpired a international hockey match. So I feel I have a lot of perspectives at a high level to discuss um, from my background. Um, my family, a little bit of background, my family very sport orientated. My mother was an international hockey player, my father was a very good athlete, and uh, my sister uh, was dual Olympian in hockey. She went to the same Olympics as me in Seoul in 1988 where she too won a gold medal and uh, very exciting, both of us were named in the World Eleven at the completion of that Olympics which was a, uh, a terrific thing to share with my sister let alone going to the Olympics. Her husband Mark Hager is uh, Great Britain's current women's coach. Um, he has been coach for a good number of years, I think 12 years for New Zealand. Um, he was a Kookaburra's captain. He was the highest goal scorer for Australian men for a very long time. And he, he, too, he has a bronze medal from 1996 Olympics. But out of all of the things I've done with those uh, different positions I mentioned, my greatest achievement outstanding young women and um, but also being elite athletes in two very, very different um, sports. So speaking to you as a parent of two elite athletes um, also hopefully is something that I can give, give feedback to you with how that has been for me as a mother. Um, at a young age, I did little athletics and in Australia, it's very interesting from the, and this is something I've noticed different between India and Australia, from a very young age in Australia, um, children are encouraged to do sport to the point that daily sport is encouraged in primary schools. It's actually mandatory in the government primary schools and there's a wonderful club system in place which has a huge emphasis on junior sport and that junior club system um, allows children from a very young age 
five, six, to try out different sports. And that was something um, that all Australians, and talking to a lot of ex-Olympians in, in a range of different sports, they've all encouraged their children to try a range of sports. Um, in my case, our, my children did little athletics, surf lifesaving, volleyball, um, ice skating, ballet, gymnastics, just and a lot of those things were only for probably half a year, but it allowed them to develop gross motor skills in a whole lot of different ranges. And finally, um, and I say this to a lot of parents who say, how do you get your children to you know, be at a top level at sport? It has to be something that they love. It has to be a passion that they find. And in the case of my two daughters, one of my daughter's passion was hockey and my other daughter's passion was ice skating. That is another conversation I'll, I'll touch on later. Um, but at a young age, really important to encourage um, children to develop their gross motor skills and their hand-eye coordination. And it doesn't matter whether it's in hockey, picking up a cricket bat, swinging a baseball bat, doesn't matter as long as they are learning these gross motor skills at a young age and having fun. And that's that's the biggest, um, most important thing for children to continue in sport. Um, my progression into the Australian team wasn't smooth sailing. I had a lot of setbacks, a lot of non-selection, and um, I think that stood me in very good stead at the time. It's hard, but it stood me in very good stead in my role as a coach and a parent down the track. Um, as to putting this into perspective, uh, non-selection, um, as, as a parent, I've always talked about you participate in a sport because you love it. That's why you, you don't take up a sport because you want to go to an Olympics or because you want to get selected in a state under 18 team. You need to love it. And then because you love it, it's, it's not a chore to go and practice. You go and practice because you're loving it. You, you're with your friends, you're having fun, and that's the basis for a healthy um, career in sport. Um, as I said, a lot of non-selection, um, particularly in my ages, probably around 19 to 23. Um, the good that came out of that was it allowed me to do full-time study and I graduated as a teacher, which um, gave me a teaching career to um, continue with once hockey had finished. Um, but I, lived in, I live in Western Australia, uh, in Perth, and WA back in the 80s really was the hub of Australian hockey. The, there was a huge influence from actually Anglo-Indian immigration. Uh, the Pierce brothers, for example, f families came, migrated to Perth and they brought hockey with them. And hockey took off in Western Australia ahead of all the other states. We then went on to get the most Australian players who all stayed and coached, so they were putting back into the grassroots. We were the first um, state to get uh, artificial turf and all of those things meant WA was, was the, the hub of hockey for Australia. Hence, you actually had to basically make the Australian team to make the state team. So I had quite a few years waiting to break into the state team, but. Um, at the same time, I made the Australian team. Uh, that was in at the end of '84, and um, the road to us winning our gold medal at the Seoul Olympics in '88 was rocky. It wasn't easy. Uh, we had to finish in the top four at the World Cup in '86. We didn't. We finished sixth. So to us, we thought our Olympic dream was finished. Then FIH brought in a Champions Trophy in 1987 and said we can have two more teams at the Olympics. Instead of there being six, there's not, there can be eight. So that gave us a lifeline in 87 to finish top two to qualify for the Olympics, which we did. We finished second to Holland and we uh, had a berth at the Olympics. So we went to Seoul in 1988, ranked sixth in the world out of eight. We had no pressure. We had no media pressure. Our men's team were ranked number one and had been the best team in the world for a huge amount of time, for years and years, or nearly probably eight years, two Olympic cycles. So we, we went to Seoul Olympics with no media pressure, uh, no expectation. The only expectation was of ourselves putting onto the field what we 
wanted, we wanted to leave nothing on the bench. We wanted to leave everything on the field and know that we'd given our best. We didn't go there saying we want to win a gold medal. And that, that I think was a really important part of our success. We never ever discussed winning a game. We never talked about the outcome. We only ever talked about the um, process. And that is something that uh, maybe we should take on board. And, um, you know, it could be that little 1% that helps. Uh, we had a couple of mantras going into the Olympics. We wanted to have controlled all the controllables so that you can control things like your fitness, uh, your, your diet, uh, your preparation, your skill development, all of those things you can control. What you can't control is the weather. You can't control the umpires. To a certain degree, you can't control the opposition. Um, you, they're things that are out of your control. How do you prepare for that? Um, we had to find a way to play a hockey match in front of a huge crowd. In Australia, probably the most would be one or 2,000 people. The, the hockey stadium in Seoul held a lot more people than that. I think it was 20,000 people. How do you get to play in front of that bigger crowd when you don't get that number? So. In Australia, what our coaching staff did was they took an audio tape of a Australian rules football game, which huge amount of crowd, 100,000 people cheering and screaming. They then put speakers all the way around our field. They then played that through the speakers. So we're playing a game of hockey in Canberra where there's two men and a dog watching, but there's 100,000 people crowd coming over the speakers. And what that did to us was massive. We couldn't talk verbally, we couldn't communicate, we couldn't call to each other verbally, which we were so used to doing. It gave us a headache uh, just from the sheer noise. But over a period of time, we got used to that and we got used to um, communicating non-verbally. And once we got to Korea, Olympic Games final, we played Korea, huge crowd, and um, it wasn't a problem. None of them were cheering for us, but it didn't matter because we'd played in front of 100,000 people cheering at a football game. So that was what we called controlling the controllables. Um, we had to fight through the round games. We had a lot of things, or little things go our way and I think that's part of success with an Olympics. You, you know, you need to get have you know, umpiring decisions that don't cost you matches and you need to have you know, take the most of your opportunities. And they were all things that we did. Remembering we were sixth in the world, we, we didn't have a great deal of expectation. Going into our last round game, we played Korea. Uh, the loser had to play Holland in the semi-final and Holland had been unbeaten for something like 10 years. We'd beaten them in a friendly earlier on in the year, a friendly match that wasn't official, but that was enough to tell us that we could beat them. Uh, the, lose, uh, the winner of that final round game got to play, um, who was it, Great Britain I think, and so both of us were wanting to not play Holland. We drew five all in that game, one of the best games I've ever played in, and um, we went on to meet Holland in the semi-final, we beat them 3-2, but going into the Olympic final we had a huge issue. Back in those days um, you had to take the field to get a medal. And we didn't have the interchange rule. We didn't have the rule we have today on, off, on, off, number of times. In the Olympics and prior to that Olympics was substitution rule. So once the player came off, they couldn't go back on the field. So they were the days of really having your top 11 and a couple of uh, bench players getting a little bit of time. But going into the final, we had two players who hadn't made, the fight, hadn't made the field in the entire Olympic Games. That was our second goalkeeper and a second um, field player. And so we were faced with the, the, the possibility that we were going to go home with 14 gold medals. And as a team, we came together and we said, no, we would rather go home with 16 silver medals than 14 gold medals. And we made that very clear to our coaching staff that their directive from us as a team was these two girls who to get on the on the field, irrespective of 
the score, they were to get on the field because as a team we would prefer to go home with 14, with 16 silver medals and 14 gold. They did get on the field in the final minutes and we ended up winning 2-0 and, um, and having the gold medal. So it all worked out well. Um, Post Olympics, very exciting. Um, we had we were awarded an OAM Order of Australia medal from the Queen for services to sport. Um, opportunities presented themselves. I got offered a coaching position in uh, Tendi University in Nara Prefecture in Japan. It's like their um, hockey scholarship university. I got up at a seven week contract, um, went up there for seven weeks, loved it so much, stayed for six months and only left because my visa expired. Over the years continued to go to Tendi and, and coach uh, at the scholarship level but then um, that sort of ended with um, having children. Another opportunity that presented itself to me after the Olympics was manager of uh, the Australian team and I, in 1994 I was the Australian team manager to Rick Charlesworth as coach and we toured with the Australian women's team to a tour of India. We came to Delhi and played test matches against the Indian women's team and toured South Africa and played test matches both in Johannesburg and Cape Town. So I'd been an international player at this stage and got the opportunity to be an international manager, which was a whole new ball game, but to work with someone like Rick Charlesworth was just amazing. Amazing man, so much is talked about him, it's all true, um, and I've learnt so much from him. Uh, there, there are things you can't replicate from him. He has an amazing um, memory, has amazing insight but um, I took as much as I could from him to, to help me become a, a better coach in the future. Uh, then uh, I talked about umpiring in my time in Japan. I, um, I had got my state level A badge, which in Western Australia, um, international players were encouraged to do umpiring badges, uh, but I got called upon to umpire Korea versus Japan in a friendly uh, match in in Japan in my time there, and that was amazing as well. Um, gives you a oh, whole new ball game. Very um, very difficult task, but something that I um, had a wonderful appreciation of uh, seeing the game from behind the whistle. I did umpire as a player. I played as a right wing, left wing, so I I umpired as a right wing, uh, but uh, got through it okay. So that was good. Uh, gone on to have children, um, as, I, as I said earlier. Um, I had one child that absolutely loved hand-eye ball sports, hitting with a tennis racket, hitting with a hockey stick, uh, running, jumping, everything like that. And she now is currently a, um, uh, a member of the Hockey Roos, so she's in the Australian National Women's Hockey Team and um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to go and follow her career uh, from India and um, that's been terrific. Um, but my other daughter was very interesting, so she had a father who was an Olympian, um, hockey player, auntie, uncle, grandmother, mother, Olympic hockey players, and yet uh, this, this child couldn't hit a ball, couldn't trap a ball, didn't want to hit a ball, and we tried a number of different sports, but nothing interested her until she put on a pair of figure skates. And she went out there as a five-year-old and just took off skating, which I'd never been on the ice. I didn't realise that that's not what you're meant to be able to do. And uh, she went out and skated and um, she got picked up by Russian coaches. They, um, they saw her in Perth and uh, she ended up being an international ice skater for many years, uh, eight-time national gold medalist and um, was in the Sochi Olympic squad uh, in the top three for Sochi Winter Olympics. However, Australia only had one place there and she didn't get to go, but she achieved um, amazing results as an international figure skater. Whole new ball game, that sport. But what was amazing about my hockey connection was, so for probably five or six years, we I toured with my daughter, Jamie, and spent upward of two months at a time living in USA and living in Europe. 
um, for her to be uh, coached by the top coaches in the world. Every time we had to go to a new place, it was hockey that I called upon. So I looked up the hockey programs that were local, said we were coming for skating, and they sort of, yeah, it was random, but it was the hockey people that organised and helped us get accommodation, get transport, and, um, and, and spend two to three months at a time in these other countries. Um, in America, like I went and did some coaching, of hockey, but um, had wonderful um, assistance from the University of Virginia because we were there with ice skating for a couple of months. So hockey has helped in so many ways. Um, coaching juniors is where I started my coaching side of my background. Um, and I really came into that in order to manage the load that my hockey playing daughter, Caitlin, was having. She was playing hockey for the school and school hockey, by this stage we were living in New South Wales, school hockey was very important to her. It was a private school and private girls schools in New South Wales and in Western Australia and other states is very, very, um, not demanding, but wonderful opportunities for um, for school children to play in, in school competitions. She was playing juniors. Now, juniors in New South Wales, under 13s, under 15s and under 17s is mixed. Boys and girls play together, play hockey, full field, together. Um, at that, when we first arrived and saw that, we were like, mm, not sure about that, but the benefits that came out of that were amazing. And you think, yes, you can see the girls getting benefits from having to re get quicker reaction skills, um, get a you know, learn to be, do things quickly, learn to be strong, learn to be fast, and it really brought the best out of them. The boys, what did they get out of it? They got socialisation skills. They got, uh, they learnt how to, um, yeah, play sport with people of different abilities and socialise. And so it was an absolute marvellous thing. And to this day, New South Wales still has junior, junior hockey that is mixed up to the age of 17. Um, so coaching juniors, uh, my daughter's playing school, she's playing junior with the mixed competition, she's playing senior hockey and she's put in an institute now uh, because of her um, identified talent. So she had a lot of hockey on. So I actually got involved in coaching so I could manage some of those things and say, no, I want you to you know, go and have a balanced life. And, you, you do need to do less training here and you need more sleep or you, you need to go to a friend's party and have fun. So trying to help her keep a balanced life. Um, the club system, as I touched on earlier, gross motor skills are being developed from the age of five in Australia in any sport. And this is something I really hope we can help introduce into uh, India and Picking up a, a stick or a bat or a ball or anything before the age of 12. I think I mentioned earlier, Australians have a national championships at the age of 12, whereas 12, 11 or 12 is really the first opportunity Indian children get when they go into the um, institutes to um, pick up a hockey stick. And that's you know five or six years of gross motor skill development that Indian children haven't got and it takes quite some time to get that to actually get back to a level playing field. My coaching goals, um, being a parent puts a different spin on coaching and it's for the better. I've had wonderful people to learn from, Rick Charlesworth, uh, Warren Birmingham, a wonderful um, men's hockey player in Australia who coached New South Wales or headed up New South Wales and learnt so much from him. Mark Hager, my brother-in-law, was always picking his brains. Uh, Michael Nobbs, so many different coaches who I've learnt from. And if there's anything I want to say to any of the aspiring coaches out there, don't ever think that you can stop learning. Because when you stop learning, it's time to stop coaching, I think. Um, initiative, teaching children to have initiative. Allowing children to be proactive in their learning. Um, you know, not in the old days it was like people got told what to do, how to hit, how long to do this. It was never a two-way street. It was always one way. The coach said and the child did it. Whereas now we need to 
constantly make it a two-way stream. So the child is proactive in learning. So when it gets out onto the field and they have to make a decision as a player as to something that has to change or um, in the middle of a game, they have that initiative, they have that ability to say, hang on, this is what's going wrong, I need to do this and I can step up and do this. Um, so that's something as a coach I would really encourage doing. Um, and education as a coach, education, your school, so important. Um, foods, uh, teaching children how to look after their bodies, the fuel, what's best to fuel your body, fitness, rehabilitation. If you're coaching young children, you don't need to worry about fitness. You need to worry about them having fun so that they're going to stay in the sport and learning the skills through play and fun and then having an opportunity to just experiment and, and, and enjoy the game. And life skills, learning about consequences of the actions that you make. You know, you can choose to do this and this, but the consequence will be this. So it's now your decision. Are you prepared to take that consequence? You are? Okay. But um, so they are all the education things that I've learnt and been able to apply to my coaching and parenting skills. Children now living in their 20s, uh, are in per living in Perth, they're in their 20s. Um, and um, living, yeah, their own dream. And I'm up in isolation in India, but happy to be isolated because until we get this virus under control, it's really important we all stay indoors. We've seen what's happened with opening things up just in the last couple of days and um, shows the importance of us staying put and happy to do that. Um, India's progress. Uh, I think it was a year or two ago, Youth Olympics was on. Um, that was five-a-side and five-a-side is a five-a-side hockey is something that's, I think there's a World Cup coming up in a couple of years. It's something that's going to take off and India fared brilliantly. I mean, five-a-side game is so perfect for Indians' style of hockey. Two silvers, the men and the women both won silvers and um, the men Junior World Cup couple of years ago also won gold Indian men's junior world cup team here in played here in India. The men and women's team have both qualified for the Olympics. Uh, the women particularly is exciting because it's the first time they've qualified under their own steam. They qualified for 1980 as a result of other team countries pulling out because of the boycott and they qualified in 2016 as a result of South Africa pulling out and um, they were given the position there. But this is the first time that they qualified off their own back. So fantastic, um, terrific coach in Jord Marine and an uh, excellent group of girls working together. Um, they're going to be a force, yeah. Boys team living together, working together in Bangalore at the moment and um, coming along really well. Um, my dream, I'm a very proud mother and wife. My dream is to see my daughter playing for Australia at the Olympics next year in Tokyo, playing against my husband's Indian team in the final. Uh, that would be terrific. But as I said, very proud mother and wife. I have been uh, Emma Olympic gold medalist um, and that has led to lots of opportunities which has allowed me to uh, become a coach, become a journalist, become a um, umpire, oh, I can't really call myself an umpire one international match doesn't really count but um, I did umpire at top level in Perth for a long time and loved it and, and become a manager for a short time and, and learn under Rick Charlesworth so very exciting life as a result of hockey and um, I'm doing a wonderful job in international tournaments following Indian hockey, people following Australian hockey um, the differences I, I get off, often asked. I went to a, um, a it was, uh, where did we go? Gualia, and I got asked to address the uh, graduates at the Physical Education um, Institute there and got asked quite often, the biggest question that came up was um, what is the difference between India and Australian hockey? And I hope I've touched on that fairly um, adequately today. Uh, one question, how has been the transition playing on natural surface to AstroTurf improvement challenges? Um, yeah, I think 
as, as you, anyone who follows Indian hockey knows how India was such an amazing force all those years, huge number of Olympic gold medals back in the early days. That the early days were on grass and, um, and I think the advent of, of AstroTurf actually was instrumental in, in ending India's dominance over hockey because the other countries um, with the advent of AstroTurf actually were able to develop skills to, to catch up to India. And, um, and then actually went on and probably developed things like sports sciences and that even further to um, ahead of India. India is now catching up and um, but I, I, I think learning grassroots skills, I did all my junior coaching on grass and I know a lot of children here learn on mud and grass and stones and, and very poor services, not a problem, that's great. You learn how to trap, you get great um, ability to trap with the bouncing ball. Children who learn on a perfectly flat surface where it runs perfectly flat and true all the time, they don't learn to develop that upright trapping skill that um, people who have learnt, or children who have learnt on difficult surf surfaces have. Pushing a ball, pushing a ball on a mud field is so much harder than pushing a ball on turf. So when that child who has developed their hockey skills on mud, they've got you know, a lot more strength, good technique and all those things. So it's, it's not a bad thing learning on grass or learning on mud or learning on, on porous surfaces so that when they get to the level of turf, um, it's, it's going to help them. You've been coaching athletes from grassroots level to the most elite levels. What are the major differences you find? Um, that probably relates to learning how to um, change styles and change structures according to the players that you have. Um, so I had some, I was watching a, a presentation the other day and they were talking about how do you know when to do a full press which is pressure on the defence to try and stop them getting out. How do you know when to do a full press compared to doing a fall away 60, 75? The, the Indian men, they've got a guy called Mandeep, Mandeep as their centre forward, one of the best pressers in the world. When he's on the field, you do a full press because he is brilliant at it. He leads it. His athletic ability allows that to be done and the team are able to adapt to that. When he's not on the field, it's you don't have the other personnel to do it as well as he does. So learning your, pe your personnel that you have in your team then allows you to choose what style and what structure you're going to play. Um, the major difference is learning at grassroots levels. It's teaching skills. Um, I think I talked about it earlier. Teaching skills but having maximum participation so that the child leaves having had fun, being with friends, having had a hundred touches, not standing in a line of 50 kids waiting to get one go. Maximum participation is what's all important in teaching young children. Um, and mini games, you know, unstructured, allowing them to explore and, and have fun and, and learn through their own development. At a top level, um, I've, I've not coached internationally in terms of country, I've only coached internationally at um, a university level and at a, at a state level in um, New South Wales and that is a whole new ball game. You get the players who, the players come to you already with all the skills and all those things in place and understanding and so you almost become more of a manager at that higher level compared to the grassroots where you're coaching. You're actually teaching skills, teacher background. Um, Sunil Bhatia has asked me, Aussies are such a huge force in world hockey, what were your priorities when you became, I didn't become the country's coach, I've coached junior hockey and I've coached state junior hockey and I've coached club hockey in seniors and I coached in Japan at a university so um, I certainly haven't gone to that level, um, I don't aspire to, I love coaching juniors and that's yeah, where my interest um, has always stayed. Um, how well do you rate the present Indian women's hockey team? Um, yeah, they, they beat USA in an amazing, 
uh, two games. I was privileged enough to watch it. They played USA at uh, Bhubaneswar last year. And the first game, they won comfortably. But the second game, they actually, the four goal um, lead that they had going into the second game was actually whittled away by half time. So that put the Indian women in a position of enormous pressure in front of a full stadium in Bhubaneswar. Now the men through the Hockey India League are used to playing in front of massive crowds. The women aren't. And the women, under the tutelage of Jord Marine, absolutely outstanding um, composure and um, yeah, I was very impressed in their ability to fight back, never give up, dig deep and um, do what they had to do to get, that, to get that goal back and qualify under their own esteem for the Olympics. So very exciting. Top 10, to, or probably the second to the 10th team in women's hockey, even the 12th team, there's not a lot in it. Even with the men's competition, teams one to eight, there's not a lot in it. And Olympics are a, a really, they're a different ball game. You know, it's, it's the biggest stage in the world for sport. So, yeah, anything can happen. What tips would you have for upcoming coaches, managers from all the different perspectives you have learnt from? Um, if you're coaching children, it's not the same as coaching adults. Uh, coaching children, focus has to be on developing skills, developing hockey skills, developing hand-eye coordination, gross motor skills, juggling. Teach your children how to juggle while they're in isolation. Get some balls out. Learn the eye tracking. Get them developing their eye tracking. These are all things. You don't need a hockey stick to learn these skills. Um, so that, from a parent point of view or a coach of junior, if you're doing online um, education to young ones, trying to find things that are, are going to allow their development in these gross motor skills, not just um, hitting a hockey ball around. Um, and I think the, the other thing with, from a coaching perspective is, is, is learning how that, you know, hockey is a wonderful world, um, but how it allows um, people to develop in so many other facets of their life, in their, their jobs, their education, as people, as parents, as adults, as you know, good members of society. How much impetus do you give to psychology, S&C, physiotherapy, rehab, nutrition in today's scenario? Today's game is a whole new ball game compared to our day. Today's game is all about all of those factors that you just said. S&C, um, that, that is one of the major reasons why India actually fell off back over the last couple of decades because there wasn't um, the qualifications in teaching S&C and even to a degree uh, qualified physiotherapy and sports nutrition. It's, it's taken a long time to come in. It's a huge importance in today's game. The change to four 15 minutes is huge. Um, the pressure it puts on the body, the body has to be so fit, so fast. Gone are the days of being able to be slow so you play as a fullback. There's no slow players now in top national teams. There's no position for anyone who's not fit. So it's, it's a huge importance. Um, the Indian men and women both have wonderful S&C coaches and that, that is a huge part of their success. Um, if you've had a chance to see any of the um, uh, you know, webinars that are online um, regarding S&C, particularly from... Wayne Lombard, who's the women's S&C, and Robin Ar Arkell, who's the men's S&C. Yeah, wonderful, one, wonderful um, contribution to the men and women's hockey program. Three important advices to grassroots players. Uh, learn your skills. Uh, have, have very good basics. Learn, teach, as coaches, teach children very good basics, teach them so that by the time that they've got to a top level, um, their basic skills are a second hand, that second nature. Um, I think of, uh, reading a, or hearing of a study um, of top athletes that was done, they were saying that you need to practice 10,000 hours to be excellent at a skill. Um, 
to get 10,000 hours in to be excellent in school, that's a school has to start at a young age. You know, it has to start at the age of six or seven. And as I said, it doesn't have to be trapping and hitting a hockey ball, but it has to be learning to track a ball, learning to, you know, hand-eye coordination. So um, I've forgotten what the question was, but um, yeah, that, that would be my advice. Are you having my gold medal with you now? Um, if yes, can we see it? Uh, no, it's home with my daughters looking after it um, in a safe. Um, because living in India, living, I came up here before uh, the coronavirus was an issue and we do a lot of travelling and um, we're always, you know, we're going to Mumbai and um, Amritsar and... Bhubaneswar and Lucknow and we're always travelling so in terms of security um, no it's best to be home in WA with my children and my guard dog looking after it. Uh, I've missed a couple of, tell us more about your experience in the Olympic finals. Okay going into the Olympic grand final we had a we had an interesting um, feeling amongst our team. Uh, I touched on earlier about get, making sure that we walked away with 16 medals. But the other interesting thing was we took the pressure off ourselves by saying, you know, at the end of today, we can have a really bad match. This is going into the day of the Olympic Grand Final. We can have a really bad day today and walk away with an Olympic silver medal. So that attitude gave us the thought, we've got nothing to lose here. And um, taking pressure off, psych, psychology, and back in those days we worked with a psychologist and that was actually very, very new to sport, but learning breathing techniques when um, you're under pressure, learning that, you know, little your routine is going to get thrown out. We had students rioting on the street in, Korea, in Seoul. We had to have a police guard to get us to the field. Um, at one stage um, the bus got taken by the police through a red light because of this, the rioting that was happening and um, the, the bus driver hit one of the, the guards who were guarding us and drove, drove over it. Like we're seeing motorbike crashes and car crashes and all these things that you know, on the way to Olympic final, you have to, these things happen, you have, to, you have to roll with it and you have to learn to you know, you deal with the what ifs that can happen. Um, yep, sorry, going on a digress there. Going into the Olympic final, we played Korea. We'd previously drawn with them 5 all. We'd beaten the Dutch in the semi-final two days earlier. And a lot of people were saying, oh, I think you've played your final. And we had to. We had to play our final against the Dutch. They were the best in the world for a decade. Um, so we got to the final. We knew that Korea, we had the Korean president there. We knew if the Korean women won, they were going to get a house, a car, a pension for life. We weren't going to get that. <laughs> but you know what? We went out there and we said, we've prepared for this. We've done everything we can. We've controlled everything we can control. We're going to go out there and talk about the process, play our process, and the result will be what it will be. Um, so we ended up winning 2-0. We Early in the game, we missed a penalty stroke. Um, then uh, early in the second half, we were awarded another stroke and a different girl stepped up to take that. And then I was fortunate enough to get uh, the second goal with a, um, a set play, which was pretty exciting. It was um, in, my, in the Olympic team was four girls from my club in Perth, four of my, well, my sister and two of my girlfriends. And um, it was my sister who forced the free hit. My girlfriend took the free hit, Elspeth, hit it through to Jackie Pereira, who was another girl from our club. She deflected it into space for me and I was able to hit the ball in the net. So that gave us a two-goal buffer with 13 minutes to go and allowed us to get the other two players who hadn't made the field on and we were able to win the game 2-0. In which were you good at? Okay. I was a wing, which nowadays is called a striker. Um, my greatest asset was my speed. My speed and um, I think my decision making to make the right decision in the circle as to pass or shoot or get a penalty corner. But always I think uh, something I prided myself on was the fact that I always 
made every opportunity in the circle have a result and um, that along with my speed were the two main things. I was very bad at tackling <laughs> and anyone watching this who ever knows me or saw me play would agree but the thing was as a young one or particularly when I was missing out on state teams I had people telling me oh you, you're bad at tackling you need to go and learn how to tackle more and this is another message I'd like to share yes I did need to work on my tackling but what I worked on was what I was good at and I was fast and I was good at breaking away and getting into space and I continued to work on that and get better at it and that is what got me selected in Australian teams. It wasn't the fact that my tackling did get better, um, it still wasn't good enough to be a defender. I wasn't a defender, I was a striker. Um, today's game has changed a little bit in that everyone defends and everyone attacks but it's a sta still the same message that um, don't always focus on what you're bad at, uh, focus on what you're good at as well and get better at it and that's what gets you selected. Um, how tough is it to ref an international match? <laughs> wow, uh, Korea, Japan. It was a friendly, but in those days um, <laughs> it wasn't really very friendly. I did my best, um, blew my whistle loud. They knew I wasn't an official umpire because one of the umpires hadn't turned up. But, you know, I umpired as a player and I've actually been asked to talk to people coming through umpiring. And, and my thing is you can have a hockey game without an umpire. You can't have a hockey game without players. So the focus of the game is on the players. And if I walk off after I'm playing a hockey match and have not been noticed, I know I've done the best job umpiring. Because that's my job as an umpire, is to facilitate the game for the players to get the best possible game and for the, the team that should win or should lose or should draw, the result is reflective of the game. Um, so I used to like walking off a hockey match and if I wasn't noticed, if people didn't even know that I was noticed that I was the umpire, it, it, it was great because it showed that I hadn't um, had any part in the game except allowing it to continue and to be played as best it can for the players. What remains yet unfulfilled in your bucket list? <laughs> oh wow, um, in terms of hockey I sort of got thrown into coaching and I loved it, I love coaching at a junior level. Um, I set up a, uh, a, a, a hockey program at a private girls school in Sydney, PLC Sydney, and I absolutely loved that. Um, we started with year fours and now, um, since I've left, and Michael Nobbs is continuing to run that program, which is fantastic under his tutorage, um, grade two, so six-year-olds are starting in school, learning hockey and doing it, training twice a week, playing on a Saturday, uh, modified, it's modified, it's smaller sticks, it's, you know, there's a program in Australia called um, Hook Into Hockey, uh, skinnier handle for little hands, shorter for little hands, wider um, hook, um, softer ball that doesn't hurt when you get hit. What's, it's a huge program in Australia. Um, the modified equipment is made here in India, so that's something that maybe... You know, we can also look at getting getting into. I don't know how it would work with schools. Um, it probably wouldn't. It's probably best to work through a club system, but there isn't a club system at the moment in India either. So, excuse me, lots of opportunity to um, develop. Don't know if I answered the bucket list question. Um, go to Olympics and watch my daughter achieve. And not even Olympics, I've got to watch a Pro League, World Cup, Champions Trophy. Enjoy the journey as a parent. Um, my oldest daughter has put back into skating. She's not competing now. It's, it's not a sport that you can continue to compete at in your mid-twenties. Putting back in a coaching uh, capacity and a wonderful role model capacity, so proud. Uh, what were you good at? I answered that. I was first runner on... Um, defensive penalty corners, um, so that was something that 
talking about attacking and defensive penalty corner, they are all specialist positions. And coaching juniors, particularly, really important that children get to experience all of the different um, injecting. I know there's a big thing about drag flickers, and you've had some of the best drag flickers in the world. You know, Sandeep Singh, um, your your female drag flicker at the moment, Gurjit, is one of the best in the world. Uh, but there still needs to be a really good injector, and there still needs to be a really good trapper. So you know, dark things allow juniors to develop because you can have the best drag flicker in the world but if you don't have someone to trap it properly and you don't have someone to inject it properly, um, it, it's not going to matter. Given a chance to coach in India, Indian hockey team, would you take up the opportunity? No, um, I'm not up to date enough now with um, the later, with coaching. As I said, I love coaching at a junior level. Um, I actually tried to help coach at a junior level here in, in Delhi, but that didn't work out. Um, no, I'm nah, that's not not on my bucket list. <laughs> uh, rehab nutrition, okay. Nutrition is something that uh, has been a very big part of our life and my daughter's life as elite athletes. Um, David's background is. Um, he has an amazing background of um, S&C biomechanics and a particular interest in, in nutrition. And um, even though now up here he's director of high performance, he still you know, oversees a, a lot of those areas. And for a child to learn what fuel best feeds their body to allow them to be at their best and I'm not talking just sport, I'm talking when they're doing exams or when they're you know, at school, learning what effects carbohydrates have on the body versus proteins versus fats. They are all things that are really important, have been really important part of our life and, um, and, and learning how your body reacts to these um, has been really important, uh, yeah, huge, huge priority. Asking about the Australian coaches now, um, both Australian coaches, head coaches, uh, Colin Batch for the men and Paul Godoyne for the women are both former hockey great players, are both Olympians. Um, Colin Batch uh, was from 84 era, 1984-88 era and um, he went on to coach in Belgium and I think really started the the start of Belgium being a world force in hockey and then ended up in New Zealand for a stint and then he came back into Australia as the men's head coach. And the women's head coach, Paul Godoyne, he was assistant coach to the, to the men for quite some time and he's come across to the women's program, former great hockey player. Um, he was a little bit later, he was around 96-2000 and um, both doing you know, terrific job with both teams. Both teams are ranked in the top three in the world so um, that's no mean feat and um, the women particularly have moved from five up to as high as two. Um, I, think, I think they're sitting on three at the moment just as a result of the last Pro League game against Argentina and, and that changed on that day which was the last Pro League game. So yeah, doing, doing really well there. Australia remains one of the best hockey nations on earth, both male and female, fantastic to watch. Fantastic to watch Australia playing and fantastic to watch India playing. I've been very blessed to be able to go and watch India play in Pro League games and Olympic qualifyings and Aslan Shah and, and World Cups and, you know, one of the greatest nations in the world to watch play hockey. Any change in major playing rules that you would recommend? Um, there's been changes nearly every year for a couple of years now. I think this is be the first year there hasn't been a rule change. I think in time that there may need to be a rule change in terms of drag flicking if it becomes a danger. I know with the use of protective equipment now, um, everyone at top level and like in in junior level in Australia has to have protection with the face masks, the first runner having their kneecaps covered, putting in extra padding on their um, shin pads, wearing the bigger gloves to protect from hand injuries. So the introduction of uh, protective gear plus the introduction of the 40 seconds to be allowed to get ready um, and put all that protective gear on has been a terrific rule change. But I don't know if 
down the track. I know there's been a few competitions where a field goal's been worth two and a penalty corner's been one to take away um, the drag flick who had the ability to win a game for a, for a team. But I think teams now are better at defending and, uh, and the defences of, of probably come with confidence from wearing the protective gear. And um, I don't think attacking penalty corners now have as big an effect as they did over the last decade with having you know, the world's best drag flicker. Argentina have lost Pellet, but they're still doing really well in the men. Um, he would walk on the field and you knew he was going to hit two out of three penalty corners were going to go in, but he's now not playing and Argentina is still doing well. Most of my international career was played on, on artificial turf, so that's, that's the, the surface that allows the best quality skill to be played and that's ultimately what you want in a hockey match. Um, but as I said, there's a place for grass and there's a place for other surfaces to learn skills from a junior level and playing on that on that other turf. If you can't get on a turf, you can still have a great time playing hockey on clay or on grass. So um, ideally turf, but it, it, it doesn't have to be. Goalkeeping domain is very important too. What are your insights on goalkeeping? Um, Another good initiative um, in junior hockey is quite often not, or is not specialising children into positions. And um, we used to have a rotation to a rotation in junior hockey, so everyone got a go at being the goalkeeper. Everyone got a go at being defender. Everyone had time in the midfield and everyone had time up front. So coming through junior hockey, you've experienced all these different positions. Goalkeeping, I mean, you as a coach, you can't be a specialist in everything and there are now every major country in the world has goalkeeping coaches and um, you know it, it's an area of expertise that is just that is their area and um, there's so many wonderful goalkeeping coaches you know, Barrett Chetri is um, former Olympian from 2012 and, and you know he's putting back in, and helping coach and develop Indian goalkeepers. It is a really specialised position. It's not something that, I mean, at a junior level, you can teach the basics, you know, correct equipment and everything, but we, we want people to play hockey for fun and if a, a child gets stuck in the goal and doesn't want to, they're not going to come back. They're going to go and play soccer or something else. So really important that everyone gets a, an opportunity to experience all different positions there. Enjoyed my talk today. Uh, thank you so much once again to um, Dr. Lunawat and Sunil for uh, giving me this opportunity through um, ISST Pune. And um, as I said, hopefully um, by the end of the year, ISST will be offering a hockey uh, course. And uh, any of you out there interested in furthering your hockey career as a coach um, or anything really, as You've seen with my life, there are many facets to succeeding in hockey. It doesn't have to be as a player. It doesn't have to be as a coach. Um, yeah, keep an eye out for the ISST uh, course that will be available sometime in the future. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.